workshop. Today we will conclude the workshop with a lecture on two um, special topics, but both of them are still closely related to Yana 2006. Uh, the first topic is uh, the structure analysis of modulated structure, and then the second one will be uh, electron diffraction. When speaking about modulated structures, we need to start with the question, what is a crystal? Essentially, the, the most, probably the most general question of crystallography. If you want to find out something, if you want to uh, learn about something new, nowadays, usually, the first place to go to uh, get some information is Wikipedia. So what Wikipedia uh, says about uh, crystal? Crystal or crystalline solid is a solid material who, whose constituents, such as atoms, molecules or ions, are arranged in a highly ordered microscopic structure forming a crystal lattice that extends in all directions. That's the definition uh, in Wikipedia. The key part here is forming a crystal lattice. So there is the concept of lattice of a three-dimensionally periodic uh, um, mathematical object uh, in space. However, there's quite a long text on crystal in uh, Wikipedia. And a bit further in the text is another definition. A crystal is a solid where the atoms form a periodic arrangement. Quasi-crystals are an exception, see below. So, Another definition, again, the concept of periodicity, but a note that quasicrystals, that there are exceptions to this uh, definition. So a definition with exceptions is not actually a very good definition. And in the section about quasicrystals, you find the International Union of Crystallography has redefined the term crystal to include both ordinary periodic crystals and quasicrystals. And the definition says, any solid having an essentially discrete diffraction diagram. So things start com to be complicated. In one article about crystal, you find three different definitions. So what the International Union of Crystallography is saying on, in, the, in the official mm, web page or document, uh, which is online dictionary of crystallography, a material is a crystal if it has essentially a sharp diffraction pattern. The word essentially means that most of the intensity of the diffraction is concentrated in relatively sharp breakpeaks besides the always present diffuse scattering. So here we have a definition, official definition by International Union of Crystallography, and that definition contains at least three very imprecise and fuzzy words, well, three, two times essentially, and once relatively sharp. So in the end, it turns out that there is no clear distinction between a crystal and non-crystal, because what is relatively sharp is very relative. Um, but the point is that there is no periodicity contained in this definition. This is because uh, of, the, of the existence of crystals that are non-periodic, yet ordered. They, they are ordered, they are not a random um, distribution of atoms, but they are not periodic in three dimensions. I do not like this uh, definition because uh, first it's really fuzzy, it contains words relatively sharp essentially, and second it actually requires an experiment as a part of the definition. So here you see that if you want to find out what is a crystal, then you need to get a diffraction pattern and then contemplate if that crystal is essentially discrete and relatively sharp. Uh, I don't think that such a such a basic uh, and at least intuitively understandable object as a crystal uh, needs a definition that uh, relies on such, uh, such concepts. So I decided to uh, go against the mainstream. I don't know if you know the TV series Renegade uh, with uh, Lorenzo Lamas. So that's, uh, 
a picture from that series. And I simply say that crystal, uh, an ideal crystal, is an atomic solid with long range order. Uh, I think that contains all that we need to know. The reason why International Union of Crystallography did not adopt this definition is not that they would not come up with such a simple idea, of course they do, but the problem in this definition is the definition of long-range order. Because long-range order, if you start speaking with mathematicians, what is long-range order? That's a never-ending discussion. And actually even a random generator uh, in your computer provides a series with long-range order because it is predictable in some sense. So. To some extent, I understand that this definition is problematic, but uh, I still think it is the least problematic from all the definitions I have seen and that can be set up. So, uh, atomic solid with long range order, which means, at least intuitively, that if you know one part of the crystal, you, you can somehow predict or there is a non-vanishing correlation between that part of the crystal and any other part of the crystal. Well, and then a structure of real crystal is an approximation to the structure of an ideal crystal. A real crystal is never perfect, and how accurate approximation of an ideal crystal, a real crystal is, that uh, may be variable, and it may also depend on your applications or on your uh, reason why you are interested in that crystal. So for some people, for example, uh, liquid crystals, they are very, very disordered. Still, they are called crystals, um, but for many crystallographers, a, crystal, a liquid crystal is, uh, is not really a crystal. So it depends on you, how, how good crystal you need for your um, application. So that was a little introduction about uh, the definition of a crystal. And now, why do we have to struggle with the definition so much? Uh, from the beginning of the um, of, uh, of structural crystallography, from the discovery of uh, diffraction by crystals, um, people have seen that crystals indeed possess uh, three-dimensional periodicity, and that was considered um, a law of nature that crystals are periodic in three dimensions. However, uh, relatively soon. Uh, people starting, started seeing uh, diffraction patterns that were not really matching this, uh, this assumption. Because a period, 3D periodic crystal gives reciprocal uh, lattice, uh, gives diffraction pattern that can be indexed on reciprocal lattice with three dimensions. And soon people started seeing diffraction patterns which were not really indexable with three integers, but it took quite long time before uh, somebody really started thinking about it and, and developed a way to consistently describe that. But here you see an example of two such uh, strange patterns. On the left side, this is a section through the diffraction pattern of sodium carbonate. And on the right side, um, a diffraction pattern of uh, aluminum nickel cobalt quasi crystal. These are the representants of two uh, quite fundamentally different uh, types of non-periodic structures, the modulated structure and the quasi-crystal. Both are non-periodic, both can be described in higher dimensional um, superspace, but the approaches to the, to the description of these two classes of compounds are quite different and uh, quasi-crystals are limited uh, to intermetallic alloys, which may be of interest in this uh, uh, for many of you. Uh, however, in the, in the following, I will focus on the description of the modulated structures. Also, because you can describe and refine modulated structures in YANA, uh, but you cannot treat quasi-crystals in YANA 2006. That might be the, the only exception, the only class of materials for which you cannot uh, refine in Yana 2006. Yeah, so. so let's focus on this diffraction pattern a bit more closely. I, at first glance, it seems that it may not be so difficult. There are rows of reflections 
and it seems that you could find a lattice that uh, describes the whole pattern maybe maybe a unit cell like this but if you focus more closely you'll see that the line here does not follow in the line here and it even does not intercept this line in the middle and it is not possible to find a simple uh, three-dimensional lattice that uh, describes all the peaks in this diagram. However, what is possible is to find very simple lattice and associate each row of these reflections to one node of the lattice. You see these, these long rows of spots, they are all centered on nodes of the lattice. And then to describe the complete pattern, you need to introduce additional vector, which we call modulation vector or Q vector, which points from the nodes of the lattice to the peaks away from the lattice. So, for example, this peak is obtained as node of the lattice plus one times the modulation vector. This is two times, oh, sorry, and this is three times. If you look in the pattern, you find cases where uh, you need to go even four times. So this is zero, one, two, three, four. So this is a particularly rich diffraction pattern. Quite often you find modulated structures where you find only one order of satellites. So these additional reflections which are away from the nodes of the average lattice, these are called satellites and the number of modulation vectors you need to reach that satellite from the node of the reciprocal lattice is called the order of satellite. So here we can see satellites up to fourth order. Um, quite often you can see satellites only up to first or second order. Third order is already relatively rare. So that's the diffraction pattern, but what does a modulated structure look like in, in direct space, in real space, in the, uh, the structure itself? Let's first check a schematic simple structure with one atom periodically arranged in one dimension. So that would be this orange atom which repeats with a repeat distance b. And then you modify this structure by shifting the atom up and down and up and down. So an, in alternative manner shifting it uh, in opposite directions. So then you generate a structure which will have a periodicity of 2 times b. This will, atom will be down, this uh, up, this down, so there is no periodicity and this goes up again. So there is this periodicity. And you can imagine that you generated this structure by shifting the atom according to an amplitude of a wave that runs through the structure. The wave is shown here and you shift the atom to the position of the wave. And if the wave has a periodicity of two times the periodicity of the, uh, of the original structure, then you get a two-fold superstructure and in the diffraction pattern uh, you will see these big spots that correspond to the main periodicity, so to 1 over b, and then there are additional spots in the middle which correspond to the superstructure, to the perturbation of the structure, and they correspond to the periodicity of 1 over 2b. Now you can imagine that the wave that tells you how much you should uh, shift the atom is not, does not have a wavelength of 2b, but it has a wavelength that is different, that is not a simple multiple of the, of the average uh, lattice. So in this case, this is a wave that has a periodicity of 2.2 times b. If you do that, you obtain again a structure which is not periodic with the periodicity of b. The atoms are shifted, see, up, down, up, down, but the, the amplitude changes because the wave shifts. Here the amplitude of the shift is essentially zero and here it is again up, down, up, down. What we get now is a structure which is not that much different from the previous structure. We obtained it with the same idea. We just slightly changed one parameter, the wavelength of the wave. But we get a structure which is almost non-periodic. Well, with the wavelength of 2.2b, 
we obtain a periodicity after 22 unit cells. But uh, if this number here wasn't 2.2, but it was an irrational number, then we, ob we would obtain a purely uh, incommensurate, never periodic structure. And the refraction pattern looks like this. So again, we have the spots corresponding to the main periodicity. And in the middle, we get the satellite spots, which have the length that corresponds to the reciprocal of B divided by the wavelength of the modulating wave. I leave aside the physical reasons why such thing may happen. It may happen due to several various reasons. Uh, different types of modulated structures have different reasons for this perturbation of a wave or for the origin of the perturbating wave. And uh, in some cases, it's not even possible to explain clearly and unambiguously what is the, the reason for the modulation in the crystal. But the, the empirical observation is that we see crystals that are perturbed with such modulation waves. And this is one of them. This is a structure of chromium diphosphate. And here in the, in the upper part, you see the structure of that material at high temperature. And you see that it is a periodic arrangement of chromium octahedra and P207 uh, diphosphate groups that are bridging them. If you cool that structure down, or that material down, the structure changes to incommensurately modulated structure, and it looks like this. Now you see that the P207 groups are not periodic anymore. There are slight changes in the positions of the bridging oxygen. So here it's, it's down, it's higher, it's quite up very much up and here is down again. So there are shifts. And moreover, the coordination of chromium changes. It's not uh, octahedral coordination anymore, but it's an alternation of uh, octahedral coordination and uh, square pyramid. And there is a gap and then again, pyramid, octahedron pyramid, gap. So if you look here, you would say, okay, it's still periodic. The periodicity is just tripled. But it's not, because here you suddenly have a pyramid, pyramid, octahedron pyramid. So the structure is, in a reality, non-periodic. And if you look closely at uh, one atom, you can draw the modulation function that is uh, underlying the position of the atom. So here you see this atom is below the average, below the line. So we can draw the position of an atom schematically here low. Here it goes up. Here it goes even more up, even more up, and here it jumps down again. So it follows approximately such a, such a sawtooth line. So the modulation function in this case is not a sine wave. It's not a harmonic wave. It's a discontinuous function that looks like this. And if you would draw this function indefinitely long, uh, the atom would always follow the position according to the amplitude of that function. There are many examples of modulated structures. Um, it's not really clear what is the percentage of modulated structures among all structures. It depends very much on the systems you are working on. Um, when I talk to service crystallographers who solve many, many structures, sometimes 100 structures every year, their estimate is usually somewhere around 3 to 5%, which is actually quite a lot. 5% would mean that one out of 20 structures is modulated. It may really be very dif different depending on the systems uh, that, uh, that you work on, but it is definitely not an extremely uh, unusual phenomenon. And if you have several structures, if you work with more structures, sooner or later you will find one uh, that is modulated, if you haven't already. 
these are just uh, three examples just to show that you can find modulated structures in all sorts of uh, materials in intermetallics which is probably not surprising you uh, in uh, in uh, metal oxides but also in organic and organometallic uh, uh, structures but there are also other places where you can see modulated structures or at least materials related to that this is um, a granite quarry and granite is a rock that uh, no, it's a quarry granite quarry which and uh, granite is a rock that contains mainly feldspar which is sodium um, calcium silicate and quartz uh, silicon oxide and both these materials have modulated structure in feldspar these are some certain uh, composition ranges which lead to modulated structures and quartz at room temperature has uh, ordered periodic structure but when you heat it up at certain temperature range it uh, undergoes a phase transition to an incommensurately modulated structure this is a concrete construction and concrete as you know uh, the main uh, the most important constituent of concrete is cement and the most important phase in cement is allied, which is silicon aluminum or aluminum silicate, and it has an incommensurately modulated structure. And it's actually so complicated that as far as I know, nobody has yet really definitely described what is the structure of allied. That might have changed. I have uh, information dating maybe uh, five, six years ago. Uh, but uh, it's def it was definitely not so long time ago still an unsolved problem. So the material that the mankind produces in largest quantities, which is concrete, um, contains constituents that are that have incommensurately modulated structures. So it seems that we need a description of modulated structures if we want to be able to describe crystal structures um, of, uh, of materials around us. A periodic structure can be described by the positions of atoms in the unit cells, position and type. Of course. This is essentially all you need to characterize the crystal structure of a periodic structure, the types of and atoms in the unit cell. A modulated structure can be described with the same concept, so an average unit cell and positions of atoms in this average unit cell, but on top of that you have to specify the shape of the modulation functions that modify the positions of atoms in the unit cells in the structure. Um, so the average structure has three independent periodicity, the three dimensions, uh, directions in space, and each modulation, each, each modulation wave running through the crystal adds additional periodicity. So if you have certain number of independent modulation wave vectors, typically this is one, most modulated structures have just one additional modulation wave direction. But if you have D of them, then you get 3 plus D independent periodicities in the structure. And such a structure can be described in a 3 plus D dimensional periodic space. And this is the reason why we uh, describe modulated structures in superspace, in higher dimensional space. Because with that space we can recover the, the periodicity. The periodicity is a basic concept in crystallography and it helps us uh, to describe the structures. There are two ways to construct the superspace um, description of crystals. One is uh, in, in real space, uh, the other in reciprocal space. The one in reciprocal space is actually more natural to understand, uh, but you need to have certain uh, certain feeling for uh, the properties of reciprocal space. So most uh, people prefer the construction in direct space. I will show you both and it's up to you to pick up the one you like most. They are both uh, equivalent. 
So in direct space, you can start, uh, we need to limit our ourselves to one dimensional structure and two dimensional superspace. You can start again from the structure that is periodic in, uh, in real space. These are the red diamonds, which are distributed periodically in the unit cell with the length uh, A1. And then we superimpose this red modulation function. And what we can do, or we can do it, and nothing can prevent, uh, prevent us from doing it, we can take the modulation function and rotate it around the, this point, around the position of the atom, the average position of the atom, and rotate it 90 degrees, like this. The function is infinite in uh, real space, so it is, in, it is infinite also after the rotation. And now you see that while before the modulation function only told us the, an amplitude, but we had to shift the atom along the real space, the structure is in real space, so the only direction in one dimension is along here. So this amplitude told us where to shift the atom in the horizontal direction. Now the modulated position of the atom is actually really given by an intersection of this line of the blue curve with real space. So we obtain the modulated position as an intersection of the modulation function with the real space. But we, we had to add a new dimension which goes perpendicular to the real space, to the physical space. And then we do this for all atoms, for every atom in each unit cell. So here we rotated the red curve around this point, here we rotate it around this point, and here around this point. And if you do that, you obtain a picture like this, and this picture is by definition, by construction, periodic in two dimensions. So you can draw lines that connect equivalent points of the of the rotated modulation function, and you see that this defines a new two-dimensional structure, which is periodic in two dimensions, which is one dimension more than, than what our physical space has, but nevertheless, we recovered what we lost. The original structure had no periodicity, the new construction, the new mathematical construction has periodicity. And that means that we can map all the atoms from the whole structure onto the first unit cell because of the periodicity. For example, this atom has its equivalent in the first unit cell by shifting one periodicity up and one, two periodicities against A1. And we end up here. So this atom has its counterpart at this position of the unit cell. This atom has its counterpart here, and we could continue, and we would, if we did it for all atoms in the whole uh, infinite non-periodic structure, we would densely occupy this line here, and that would actually define the modulation function. So this is the idea, and this is just um, a little overview how we construct the superspace in direct space. So the new uh, basis vectors of the new superspace uh, unit cell are obtained like this. So you add certain additional vector which is perpendicular to the to, uh, physical space. And how much you add depends on the quantity Q, which are the components of the modulation vector. The little green arrow that you saw in the first uh, images uh, in the description of the uh, diffraction um, of modulated structure, that little vector had certain components, and it turns out that, that this height here is defined by the components of the modulation vector. In the we can observe uh, the fingerprint of the modulation in reciprocal space, and uh, I will now show you the derivation of, uh, of the superspace concept in reciprocal space as well. So this is a picture. This is the, uh, the, the 
indexing or description of the spots using an average lattice plus a modulation vector. And the reflections of the spots that are in on the corners of, of, this, of the average uh, reciprocal lattice, these, are, uh, these can be described with three indices. So the third index is always zero here because we are in the plane uh, of L equals zero. But this index, for example, is, is obtained as one times A star minus one times B star. So this would be A, this would be B. So it's one minus one. This is one, two. This is then minus one, two. Simple, normal, standard indexing of reciprocal lattice. But if we want to describe all the spots, we need to add a fourth index, which tells us how many modulation vectors we need to add to the reciprocal lattice node to arrive to that point. So the, the main reflections, those that are in the corners of the, of the reciprocal lattice, they just get zero because you do not need any additional modulation vector. Other spots get ones, twos, and threes, depending on how far you need to go. So for example, this this spot here, you need to go minus 1, minus 2, minus 3 times this arrow to obtain this spot. So we get four indices. And three indices are necessary to index reciprocal lattice in three dimensions. By analogy, four indices can be used to index uh, reciprocal lattice in four dimensions. So we can actually imagine that the diffraction pattern, which here has these main reflections, and these are the first order satellites, and these are the second order satellites. We can imagine that this pattern is obtained as a projection from a higher di dimensional reciprocal lattice. So we unproject, we lift the satellites up from the reciprocal physical space, and we lift them up with that multiple of certain length that corresponds to the, to the order of the satellite. So the first order satellite is lifted certain length. That length is arbitrary. We can set uh, a length of one. And then the second order satellites are lifted by length of two. And minus second order satellites goes to minus two, minus first order satellite to minus one. And if we do that for all satellites, we obtain something that again that forms a lattice but that lattice is a lattice in more dimensions than our physical space again we added one dimension more and this is the lattice this is the definition of the new basis vectors of the lattice and we got again a reciprocal lattice that is that corresponds to a periodic object but in higher dimension this is a mathematical definition of the basis vectors. This is the comparison of the definitions uh, of direct lattice, direct superspace lattice in uh, 3 plus 1D and direct uh, and uh, reciprocal superspace lattice in 3 plus 1D. Uh, well, let's uh, not uh, spend too much time on this. It's not so important now. What is important is that uh, it may not be immediately obvious, but the two derivations that I showed you are equivalent and they both lead to the same result and you can connect this superspace reciprocal lattice with this construction of superspace by the Fourier transform. So by the, by the operation that brings also um, structure factors on uh, reciprocal lattice of a periodic structure to the, the electron density um, in the periodic structure. So if you do the Fourier transform or structure factors on this lattice, you obtain a four-dimensional periodic object. And this object will have, instead of atoms, it will have continuous lines, continuous lines of electron density like this one, which correspond to the atom at different positions of the modulation function. Although the superspace description is a very useful one, 
we need to keep in mind that uh, the structures that we describe remain three-dimensional and they reside in our real physical space. So if the, the superspace description is a useful tool, but we need to extract the information about the real structures from uh, the result we get. And to do this, we use so-called T-sections and T-plots. In this picture, you see a, a superspace, um, a schematic superspace uh, um, embedding of a modulated structure. And this line here corresponds to a section through the structure, a section that corresponds to physical space. So the real structure is on this line. So in real cases, we have a three-dimensional section through a four-dimensional space. And, but this, okay, this line is here, and this line has its counterpart by, by uh, periodicity somewhere here. Okay, we can shift this point by periodicity to here, so this red dashed line has the same properties, the same sections as this line here. And if we do this for all the unit cells, we can see that all these unit cells in all the structure have their counterpart somewhere in the first unit cell, but we need to take sections that are parallel to physical space. So not sections that are parallel to this, uh, to this vector, to the basis vector of the unit cell, but sections that are parallel to physical space. And these sections are called T sections, and the coordinate that gives us the, the origin of that section along the vector A4, that is called T. That's why it's T sections. And you can plot any structural property as a function of this T and plot it and get an idea what is, uh, what is the distribution of the property uh, in the modulated structure. So for example, uh, you can plot atomic interatomic distances as a function of T. And this is an example of one such plot. This is again taken from the structure of chromium diphosphate, and it is the coordination of the central chromium atom uh, in the structure. You can see there are six curves. Four curves are here, and they have, so this is the distance. They have very little variation of the distance. So the first thing that you can see from such a t-plot is that four out of the six atoms coordinating chromium have very well-defined and little changing distances to chromium. So whatever is the, the phase of the modulation, whatever is the environment of the uh, chromium, these four atoms keep the distance in a very, very narrow interval. But then there are two atoms two oxygen atoms that change the distance very dramatically. Uh, one of them is highlighted here in green. So this is the position or distance of one oxygen atom, so one apical oxygen of the, of the octahedron. And this one is a second atom opposite. So you see that in certain part of the, of the T interval, so in about two thirds, this oxygen atom, the red one, is relatively close to, to chromium, and you can say that it's coordinating the chromium. But then suddenly it jumps, and in other part of the T interval, it is, uh, it is far from the chromium, and it's not coordinating. And the green one does the same, it's symmetry related. So in the T plot, you can see three parts. In this part, the chromium has only five coordinated atoms. So this corresponds to the square pyramid coordination you saw at the beginning. In this part, it is um, six-fold coordinated, and in this part, it's again a, a square pyramid, but it's the other oxygen that is coordinating it. So the pyramid is facing in the structure in the other direction. You can't read the geometry from here. From, you here, from here, you can't say if this is a square, py square pyramid or what is it, but you can say that there are certain variations of uh, bond distances uh, to chromium. It's in, what is important is that the point, points that are, close, that are close in T plots, they are not close in real space. So you can't say that there is a long block of structure which has this coordination, and there is then a long block of structure which has this coordination. 
no neighboring unit cells are distributed in this plot in a, a well-defined manner but they are not close to each other so here are the examples this may be the coordination in the first unit cell and this is a coordination in the uh, in one unit cell along a this is the coordination in the neighboring unit cell along c so this can be calculated of course but they are not the unit cells close in the structure are not close in t plot A very important concept in, uh, in um, uh, the superspace description of modulated structures is the superspace symmetry. It's important for the same reason why the symmetry is important for um, ordinary periodic structures. And uh, the superspace um, structures, so the superspace embedding of uh, modulated structures, has its own symmetry, which is four or five or six dimensional depending on the dimension of the superspace but it shares many properties with the symmetry of um, of uh, three-dimensional uh, structures uh, superspace symmetry must be three plus one reducible so uh, that is a mathematical expression for the fact that you cannot really mix the, f the physical space and the additional um, mathematical construction, the additional dimension that we added uh, to, uh, to get the four-dimensional description. Uh, and the general form of a symmetry operator is, uh, looks like this. And the key part, without going into details, is that it has a three-dimensional part which corresponds to the symmetry of the average structure. And it has a three-dimensional translation part, which co again corresponds to the symmetry, to the translational part of the symmetry operator of the average structure. So if you ignore modulation. And then you have parts that correspond to, to the changes in the modulation phase. So that part here that describes the symmetry in the additional dimensions, and it actually corresponds to the shifts and, and inversions of the modulation functions in the structure. So this is an example of a super space group operation. You see it looks like a normal uh, space group operation. It just has one dimension more. I will not go into details of, uh, the, of super space symmetry. That can be quite complicated, but I want to exp uh, explain you briefly the meaning of super space group symbol, because this is something you can find if you read um, literature uh, that contains descriptions of modulated structure. So the superspace group symbol, uh, the one that's most widely used nowadays, uh, is composed of three parts. The first part is just the normal Hermann Mogen symbol of the basic space group. So the space group of the average structure uh, that is um, that you obtain if you remove uh, the, all the modulations. The second part contains the definition of the modulation vector. So it gives a general um, description of the modulation vector and this, um, this, uh, this case is a modulation vector, vector which has uh, non-zero components along A star and along C star. So it's alpha zero gamma saying that the second component of the modulation vector is zero. So the ve modulation vector lies in reciprocal space in the plane A star C star with no component along B or B star. And the last part gives the definition of intrinsic shifts in the fourth dimension. So this is the part that is needed to complete the symmetry operator, this part here. This part is obtained by, uh, or this is defined by this part, so by the basic space group and the definition of the modulation vector, but this part not, and that needs to be given uh, explicitly in this, uh, in the um, uh, space group symbol. The letters S mean shift by one half, T shift by one third, Q shift by one sixth, and H s uh, shift by one uh, sixth. 
so this should be one quarter sorry so that's all you need and mostly what you are interested in at least in the first glance are these two parts so what is the average symmetry and what is the direction of the modulation vector in the space group um, in the structure so if you want to describe the structure in superspace the modulated structure then we need the structure model of the basic structure um, maybe a little a little notion here you can hear speaking about the non-modulated underlying structure uh, using the word basic structure and using the word average structure um, there is a subtle difference between the two and uh, I should be careful enough to use the two terms in the correct meaning uh, I must admit that sometimes I fail and sometimes I use uh, the, the words not quite correctly uh, but it's not that big problem you can think about basic structure as the structural model that you have in in the M40 file in YANA and that is obtained by deleting the modulation functions from the, from the structural description while the average structure is obtained by refining the structure with ignore, uh, when ignoring the satellites so if you remove the satellites from the data set you obtain a normal three-dimensional uh, data set and you can refine an average structure against this data set and so the structural model that you refine that you obtain is the average structure these two are not identical for example the displacement parameters will not be the same but in a sense these they are both very similar and they correspond to the, the, the similar concept of removing the modulation so anyway uh, the, the you need the structure model of the basic structure and then you need the description of the modulation functions and actually every structural parameter can be modulated so you can have modulation of atomic position you can have modulation of atomic occupancy so you can have a variation of occupancy um, in the structure you can also have modulation of displacement parameters so the thermal motion of atoms depends on their uh, neighborhood uh, on their surrounding and therefore the displacement uh, parameters are also uh, modulate and if you have um, more complex structure parameters like unharmonic description of uh, of the atomic uh, motion even these um, parameters may be modulated and you need a description of the modulation function so you need to say what is the amplitude of the change of that parameter uh, with respect to its average value most often we model the modulation function with Fourier series so it's a decomposition of essentially arbitrary continuous shape into constituent uh, sine and cosine waves so if you have occupational modulation you need one such harmonic function to describe the, the modulation of the atom if you have positional modulation you need th three such function because you have x y and z position of an atom and each of these uh, positions has its own modulation function um, these, uh, uh, these harmonic uh, modulation functions or the description by Fourier series has certain um, nice mathematical properties and that's why it is uh, used uh, and it's very useful however not all modulation functions are continuous and smooth and uh, not all functions can be described easily with uh, Fourier series so this is an example of a modulation function that can be well described with the Fourier series this is an example of a modulation function of occupational and positional modulation function which is discontinuous so the atom is present in the unit cell along this part of the interval but then for the rest of the of the t interval it's absent there is a vacancy there 
or the atom may be in a completely different place in the structure. So the modulation function is discontinuous. This is another case. The atom is present always, but there is a discontinuity here. So it moves, 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 and then it jumps. So this was the case for the bridging oxygen that I showed at the beginning for the chromium diphosphate. These are examples uh, of the two functions superimposed on the superspace electron density. So if you calculate a Fourier map for a superspace uh, for modulated structure, you obtain something that may look like this. So this is the real dimension. In this case, this is x2 or y. And this is the x4, so the additional dimension. And here you see the distribution of the electron density. And if you take a section parallel to, to the real space, so in this case that will be this section, each of the sections correspond to an electron density of an atom at that, at that uh, T section, or at, at, at that section of the, um, of the superspace unit cell. And here you see the discontinuous function that makes the atom jump from one position to another. This is the same case. Uh, this, this section, this, um, excuse me, this function is called Crenel function. The word Crenel comes from the crenellations that you can find on, uh, on medieval castles in Europe. So th there is no guy named Crenel who would come up with this function. That's, uh, and this is a sawtooth function uh, that gets its name from, from the obvious similarity to the sawtooth. So these special modulation functions you can define in YANA in addition to the functions, uh, uh, to the Fourier series or to harmonic functions. Before I stop, uh, I need to mention another important class of structures which are related to incommensurately modulated structures, but they are not incommensurate. They are called commensurate or commensurately modulated structures. In Truly incommensurate structures, uh, the modulation vector is, uh, has components which are incommensurate with the basic periodicity. So ideally, the, the ratio between the, length, between the coordinates of the modulation vector and the, uh, the reciprocal uh, lattice vectors should be irrational. This is not always, well, you can never say if a certain modulation vector has really irrational components because the measurement has finite precision. So there is always a rational number within the precision of your experiment that, uh, that you can find. However, if that rational number is complicated, like um, 27 over 49, that is, uh, that is so complicated rational number that uh, practically this is um, irrational and we can treat it as irrational. However, sometimes the modulation vector is clearly rational and it has components like one half, one third, or three over five. And in that case, you can always find a supercell in direct space or a subcell, smaller cell in reciprocal space, which describes all the positions, so which uh, describes satellites as well as main reflections on the same cell. And then you can describe the structure in the supercell. And you can get rid of all the problems with commensurate, also with modulated uh, structures, superspace descriptions and uh, modulation functions. However, it, is, it may still be advantageous to describe the structure in uh, superspace and these advantages uh, are that you separate the fitting of the main reflections from the fitting to s of satellites and you get a sensitive measure of the quality of your description of the superstructure. If you mix together in the supercell description uh, the weak satellite reflections and the strong main reflections, you do the refinement, you may get a very acceptable R value and seemingly good uh, refinements, but actually you may not, you may be not uh, describing the supercell uh, or the superstructure properly. And if you separate only the superstructure reflections, 
the satellites and calculate an R value, you may get an R value of 40%, meaning that uh, you really did not capture the essential of the, of the supercell or of the, of the modification of the structure from its every structure. Well, if you do it in super space, you separate, you, ha you get separate R values on uh, main reflections, separate R values on satellites, and you can see, okay, my satellites have an R value of 8%, I'm fine. You, what is more important is that the basic structure parameters are separated from the modulation parameters. So the, the atomic positions are separated from slight variations of the, of the position from one unit cell to another. So you can isolate insignificant parameters. So maybe some atoms do not have modulation at all, so you do not need to modulate them. And you also limit com, um, correlations in the structure, in the structure refinement. That's very important for stabilizing the refinement. And last but not least, if you have similar structures which differ, which have the same units, uh, same basic structure, or same, same average structure, but different modulations, you can easily compare similar structures if you describe them in the same supercell, sorry, super space model. Um, the commensurate structures have certain specifics and although it may seem that they are easier than incommensurate structures because they are, in the end, they are periodic, the superspace description is somewhat more complicated. You need to take care of few things that you do not need to do in an uh, incommensurately modulated structure. But the key point is that instead of having infinitely many T-sections describing infinitely many different unit cells in uh, incommensurate structure. Here, this is a model for a commensurate structure. So here you have a perfect intersection of the physical space with the node of the or corner of the unit cell in superspace. And therefore, from here on, you get the same section here as here. And in the first unit cell, you actually get only three different sections. So only three sections in the in the superspace unit cell are physically meaningful. All the rest is not, and it is never realized uh, in the commensurate structure. Um, I, will, I think I'll skip that. And uh, this is an example. Again, my favorite example, chromium diphosphate. Not because there wouldn't be any other example in the world, but uh, because um, I uh, like it to show the concepts on, on one structure and relate them together. This is the, a scheme of the diffraction pattern of chromium diphosphate in its incommensurately modulated phase. And you see that the, this is a main reflection, this is a first order satellite, and this is a second order satellite, and it does not lie exactly on this line. It's close but not quite. This here is the diffraction pattern of the same material warmed up, uh, sorry, cooled down by about 50 degrees or 50 Kelvin. And you see that the distribution of the positions is very similar. You still have the same um, average structure. The satellites are almost in the same positions, but now uh, let's, let me take this this place. So first order satellite, second order satellite. But now this satellite lies exactly on this line. And it is also exactly in one third of the distance from here to here. So the components of this satellite are actually minus one half, one third. So this is commensurately modulated. And you can find a smaller reciprocal cell that describes all the spots in the same um, in, on one periodic um, reciprocal lattice. But uh, these two structures are so closely related that it's almost obvious that they need or they would benefit from the same description. And you can indeed do this refinement, refine the structure, find the modulation functions, and then just change the value of the Q vector, change the value to, to the commensurate value, and you get a good fit to the diffraction pattern of the uh, of the commensurately modulated phase. So to summarize, 
Modulated structures are characterized by their basic structure and by the modulation which is superimposed over the basic structure. In uh, diffraction space, they are characterized by the presence of additional, usually weak, not always weak, but usually weak or weaker satellite reflections. And this is the way to recognize them. So if you look at the diffraction pattern, there, are, there is a principal strong uh, periodic lattice and some additional um, peaks which are weak and which do not fit the, the basic lattice. And the description in superspace is used to recover the periodicity and use established crystallographic tools like the space group symmetry or Fourier maps. And last word, I know that modulated structures are uh, maybe difficult to handle, but just don't dismiss them and don't throw these poor modulated crystals in the litter bin out of the fear that you can't deal them, deal with them. Uh, there are structures like any other, and uh, if we don't describe modulated structures, if we don't handle them, we not only may lose some of interesting crystallographic or chemical problems, but we are actually also creating bias in the in the bulk knowledge of mankind, because if you ignore something, it appears that it doesn't exist. So if you go in crystallographic database, you actually find a very small number of modulated structures, but that's not because they are not there, that's because people don't like them. And they ignore them, or no, not all of them, of course, there are important uh, exceptions, uh, but uh, many people just uh, are scared of that, and and uh, uh, ignore the structures and this is not a good thing to do and I think that at least uh, well, so if, uh, if you find a modulated structure and uh, if you do not have the time or capacity uh, to, to learn the concepts ne needed to, do, uh, to refine modulated structure at least report that the structure indeed is modulated and don't, uh, don't hide the fact from, from others. Thank you for your attention. Okay. I hope you are finished. <laughs> the final lecture from the series of uh, lectures in this workshop will cover um, a do topic that is uh, somewhat different from the previous ones and it is uh, different because it's the only time when we will deal with uh, diffraction using another radiation than uh, or other radiation than x-rays. So, so far we considered implicitly that uh, we are using X-ray diffraction for the analysis, although many things uh, that I talked about are general twinning disorder. These are structural features, and of course that doesn't depend on what radiation you use to probe the crystal structure. But we are all used to think about uh, crystal structure determination in terms of having X-ray diffraction as uh, as the tool for the um, for probing the structure, so a little outline of uh, what you will hear here here now. Uh, first, a little comparison between X-ray, neutron, and electron diffraction. Uh, then I will say something about oriented uh, electron diffraction patterns. It was a traditional, or still is, a traditional way of collecting electron diffraction uh, patterns. And I will say why this is not uh, the optimal uh, way to go for electron crystallography. Then I will come to the key concept that we are using uh, for uh, measuring uh, crystal structures uh, by electron diffraction, or determining uh, crystal structures by electron diffraction. And finally, I mentioned the, let's say, the latest or one of the latest advances, which is the 
application of dynamical deflection theory for the refinement and how much uh, that helps in, uh, in improving the results we obtain from electron uh, solution of structures by electron crystallography or electron diffraction. So this is a general flow chart uh, of uh, structure determination uh, that most crystallographers would make in one or another way. So we start with an unknown crystal structure and the first decision that we make or the first question we ask ourselves is can I make big crystals? Big means at least 50 microns. You can go smaller with modern sources but okay, let 50 microns is a, a good size for, for a crystal for organic lighter scatterers, 100, 200, 300 microns, maybe better. If you can, then the next question is, do I have some specific problem that I need to address, like magnetism or atoms with very close scattering power, or do I need to know very precisely something about hydrogen atoms? If yes, then the, the answer might be uh, neutron diffraction. If not, and if you are only interested in, uh, uh, in the crystal structure of otherwise non-complicated material, you go for single crystal X-ray diffraction and try to solve the structure. If you succeed, you're happy. If you don't succeed, you're less happy. Uh, the second branch of this diagram is quite simple. If you can't make big crystals, you go for powder diffraction, either X-ray or, again, in special cases, uh, neutron diffraction. This was the status um, still, uh, say, about 10 years ago. But uh, nowadays, the diagram should be changed in this part to another <coughs> decision point. And the question should be, can I use electron diffraction for uh, determining the, the uh, to determine the structure. If yes, then just go for it because it is uh, a method that can and most likely will give you the answer. And only if you cannot, for some reason, then go for powder diffraction. Uh, the cases where you cannot use electron diffraction are maybe various. One of them is that the material is uh, not sufficiently stable in electron beam. Another case can be that you need to use uh, some environmental, uh, some mm, like non-ambient conditions like high pressure. So if you want to do high pressure, powder diffraction, electron diffraction will not help you. If we compare X-rays with electrons, we see there are there is a strong complementarity. X-rays interact relatively weakly with, uh, with atoms in crystal, while electrons interact very strongly. X-rays impose uh, comparably little radiation damage, uh, at least uh, if we consider the volumes that are typical for single crystal X-ray diffraction, while electrons, because we focus on much smaller crystals, on these small volumes they induce relatively larger radiation damage. X-rays give us the possibility to uh, do diffraction in various environments, in high pressure, in, in gases, while uh, electrons uh, require that the experiment is done in vacuum, although environmental cells also exist where you can have the sample in some gas or even liquid, but uh, uh, the pressures of the gases in uh, these environmental cells are still very low, very low. Uh, you certainly cannot do electron diffraction experiment at the pressure of 10 gigapascal. On the other hand, X-rays require large crystals, so much larger than one, one mic micron, or they, uh, or you need to use powder diffraction with all the problems of mixtures of phases, impurities, and peak overlap. Uh, electrons can measure small crystals down to a couple of nanometers. And therefore, you can easily analyze uh, mixtures of, uh, of phases. Well, if I say easily, it's still, it may still be complicated. But if you have a mix of phases uh, in the electron microscope, you can find 
single crystals, individual crystals of different phases and measure each of them separately. Uh, while in the powder pattern you have an overlap of all of them and it may be very difficult already to, to identify that you have uh, a mixture of phases not to speak about the separation indexing and possibly structure determination uh, from such a pattern that contains uh, a phase mixture. Another difference or the difference that follows from the fact that electrons interact very strongly uh, with matter is that X-rays interact or the, X the diffraction of X-rays can be described with a, with a kinematical diffraction theory uh, which is um, a simplified uh, theory of diffraction that assumes that every quantum of radiation, every photon, diffracts only once or not at all. So it diffracts most at most once. If you do this assumption then uh, you can derive all the well-known formulas for uh, diffraction, including the structure factor equation and the fact that the intensity, the diffracted intensity in X-ray diffraction is proportional to the square of the structure factor amplitude. This kinematical approximation is very well fulfilled for X-rays and the slight deviations from it can be corrected by extinction correction in most cases, while it is not fulfilled for electrons, or the quality of the approximation of the kinematical approximation is much, much worse for electrons. The diffraction is strongly dynamical, and therefore the calculation of intensities is different. This is a general expression uh, which says that the scattering matrix is uh, given as an exponential of a structure matrix which contains a number of structure factors for all these reflections that are diffracting simultaneously. We take an exponential of that, uh, of that uh, matrix and the intensities are the squares of the amplitudes of elements of the matrix. Uh, the, the meaning of this formula is, or the important uh, um, con mm, consequence of this formula is, that intensities of each of these spots do not depend only on the structure factor related to that reflection, but on the structure factors related to all reflections that are in the diffraction condition at the same time. That makes Analy analyzing electron diffraction complicated uh, and also more computationally expensive and time consuming. Traditionally, electron diffraction has, is, be, is uh, performed or has been performed mostly in, um, in the form of oriented diffraction patterns. The reason for this is that uh, in electron diffraction unlike X-ray diffraction, a single diffraction pattern provides you essentially undistorted planar section through reciprocal space. So if you take a single diffraction pattern, it gives you a single plane in reciprocal space, and if you properly orient your crystal, then this plane in reciprocal space will contain a lot of uh, interesting and easy to interpret information. So here you see a few examples of such oriented diffraction patterns. And you see if you orient it properly, here you have in this uh, strontium iron oxide, uh, you have the A star direction in one, uh, A star vector in one direction, the C star in another direction. You can measure directly from the picture the reciprocal lattice parameters. You also see that there are some satellite reflections in there. In this picture, this is a diffraction pattern from aluminum, copper, iron, quasi-crystal. You immediately see there is a tenfold symmetry. It's very easy to interpret. This here is a convergence be convergent beam um, electron diffraction pattern, which is obtained if, you, if your beam is not just parallel line, but it is a conical converging uh, beam of electrons, and then you get beautiful and very rich on information patterns. So this beauty and uh, high information content that's easy to interpret led to 
to the habit of collecting electron diffraction data uh, in the form of oriented diffraction patterns. However, these patterns are most affected by dynamical diffraction because in oriented diffraction patterns there, there is a large number of simultaneously uh, diffracting um, spots and the intensities of the spots mutually affect, influence each other and the resulting intensity is therefore strongly affected by dynamical effects. In 1994 uh, a method of precession electron diffraction was introduced which aimed at suppressing these uh, strong dynamical effects in oriented diffraction patterns. The method um, is uh, based on an idea that uh, an electron beam does not have to be stationary in, in the microscope, but it may be, it may be easily, uh, or its trajectory may be easily modified by the, by the electron optics. So it may be made move along precession, um, or it may be moving on the surface of a cone, so it can perform a processing motion, so the beam instead of falling on the sample like this, it is moving and it's falling on the sample like this. So this is shown on this picture, that the beam is moving along the surface of the cone, it's falling on the sample or entering the sample in the same uh, position and then the central or direct beam also is moving on the cone when it's leaving the sample but also all the diffracted beams are moving on the surface of a cone but then we have uh, another set of post specimen deflection coils in the microscope which can be used to focus the the beams back to spots so in the end we get again spot diffraction pattern in the diffraction plane. So at first glance the diffraction pattern from precession electron diffraction looks the same as without. However, there are important differences in the distribution of intensities. So this here is a diffraction pattern from the 0, 0, 001 um, orientation of orthopyroxene, a mineral silicate without precession and with precession of 2.4 degrees. So that means that the half angle of the cone is 2.4 degrees. And you see that there is an important difference in the distribution of intensities. And briefly uh, saying this contains very little information on the structure, while this contains a lot of information about the structure. And there, is a, there are multiple advantages of uh, precession electron diffraction. So, for example, for symmetry determination, if you want to determine the symmetry uh, from the, the oriented uh, diffraction patterns, then the PED, precession electron diffraction, images look more symmetric because they are not so sensitive to the exact orientation of the crystal in the beam. For structure solution, we can say that intensities are more kinematical or less affected by dynamical effects and therefore they are easily or more easily handled by the structure solution software like Superflip or Shell XT or SIR. And for structure refinement the advantage is that uh, they are also less sensitive to crystal thickness and crystal orientation and imperfections of the crystal and they are more sensitive to structural parameters like atomic positions and, uh, and uh, atomic types, atomic species. So for all aspects of uh, structure determination, precession electron diffraction is a useful, uh, useful uh, method. Using oriented diffraction patterns, a number of structures, uh, including quite complex structures like, um, like uh, certain quasi-crystal approximants, um, have been solved with and without precession, but it was still a tedious, uh, long-lasting uh, exercise. Um, it is difficult to collect a large set of nice oriented patterns and it was also difficult to extract the structural information from these sets of patterns. So it has not become 
uh, a very widely used uh, technique despite of the successes that demonstrated in these and other papers. In 2007, a group uh, of uh, Ute Kolb, uh, a scientist uh, crystallographer in at the University of Mainz in Germany, came with uh, the with the idea that we could do in electron in transmission electron microscope the same technique that is uh, usual uh, in X-ray diffraction and that is recording non-oriented patterns and slowly. Mm, sequentially tilt the crystal uh, while recording a sequence of diffraction patterns. So then it looks like this. You have a crystal, you shine a beam through it, and then you tilt the crystal and record the diffraction uh, while tilting, and you obtain a set of non-oriented uh, diffraction patterns from the crystal. So in uh, that group called this method diffraction tomography, because it is similar to standard tomography, but it's running in diffraction space. And, uh, but it is um, equivalent to the rotating crystal method that is used uh, when collecting uh, X-ray diffraction data with area detector. It's just the same thing. This is then the result of, uh, of such data collection. It's a three-dimensional uh, rendering of reciprocal space. So we have good coverage. You see this missing wedge here, this is because in electron microscope we cannot tilt the crystal, rotate it around. There is always certain limit on the tilt, so we have a missing wedge of data. But a part of that missing wedge, the coverage of reciprocal space is complete, and we can uh, extract intensities of all of these spots. When you, if you read the literature on uh, electron diffraction or three-dimensional electron diffraction, you will find many uh, different names. So the Mind School called this method ADT, Automated Diffraction Tomography. There is another school in Stockholm, in Sweden. They call it RED, Rotating Electron Dif or Rotation Electron Diffraction. You can find abbreviations like IEDT, Integrating Electron Diffraction Tomography, or Manual Diffraction Tomography, if you do it uh, really like by hand and not with uh, automated, uh, automated procedure. Rotating Crystal Method, I mentioned already. MicroED, that's the name that was developed by a, a group in the US who do, again, essentially the same thing. Uh, so we will see what the future will bring, what will be the final established uh, uh, name for this uh, family of methods. But uh, currently, I uh, like to call it EDT, electron diffraction tomography. To make long story short, um, this, uh, this method is very well suitable for solution of uh, crystal structures uh, by electron diffraction. It can provide uh, structure solutions of uh, even quite complex materials. This is one example, a zeolite um, with uh, the volume of the unit cell of um, seven and half thousand cubic angstroms and 51 independent atoms. Uh, this is already a relatively complex structure, but certainly not the most complex uh, solved by electron diffraction. So now, um, if the material is uh, well crystalline, so if there is not a problem with the crystallinity of the material, and if it is stable or at least reasonably stable in the beam, then there is a very high chance that we can analyze and determine the structure from electron diffraction data. This is another example, a modulated structure of bismuth niobium oxide. This is, uh, you see the complexity of the diffraction pattern with so many spots appearing there. And this is then the refined structure um, of the material. Maybe here I can just mention that uh, one advantage of electron diffraction over powder diffraction is not only the, the sheer fact that you have single crystal data, but you have also much stronger data. This structure gives um, 
um, powder pattern, X-ray powder pattern, where you can see, uh, I think, something like two or three satellite peaks, which are clearly visible as peaks, and then remain uh, maybe a couple of more, but up to 10 peaks uh, of the satellite reflections. Here you see all these weak spots are actually satellite reflections and you can see a few thousand, uh, a few thousand of them in, in the collection of the diffraction patterns. So completely different world and obviously also completely a uh, different amount of information that you can extract from such uh, diffraction data. And the uh, final example, uh, just to show that uh, we really can do things with very small crystals. This crystal here has dimensions of about 10 times 20 nanometers and it allows a collection of a complete diffraction pattern like this and then the structure solution comes out very nicely from it without any problem. So really the size is not a problem for electron diffraction. So electron diffraction tomography has the advantage of providing complete or almost complete diffraction data. It's conceptually very simple. Uh, you just find the crystal and record the series of diffraction patterns without any prior orientation and so on. So it can be fully automated. automated. There are easy solutions uh, coming out of, of such data using direct methods or charge flipping. Unfortunately, uh, the refinements are not so easy. They give poor figures of merit, unreliable atomic positions, and unreliable ESDs, estimated standard deviations. So under an un un uncertain accuracy of the result. And the reason for the fact that we get poor figures of merit and not so good fits is the dynamical diffraction. Even if you combine the the data collection with precession, which tends to suppress the dynamical effects. Even then, the dynamical effects are there. And this is the FOPS, FCALC plot. So a distribution of observed and calculated uh, um, structure factor amplitudes for the orthopyroxene structure. And you can see a s strong deviation, strong scatter of the values around the expected um, line. And this is caused by, or mainly caused, by the dynamical diffraction, which causes the deviations of the expected, uh, of the measured intensities from the expected kinematical ones. So the dynamical diffraction theory, i just repeat briefly, um, modifies the intensities and the intensities of, uh, of reflections that are simultaneously in diffraction condition, they, they are mutually inf uh, influencing each other. Therefore, we need to, if we want to simulate it, if we want to do the calculation, we need to build a matrix containing the structure factors of all the reflections in diffraction condition and then do a calculation which involves exponentiation of a matrix, which is um, a well-defined mathematical operation, but it requires a uh, certain computing time. So the computing uh, time of, uh, of this uh, approach is rather, rather long compared to the, um, the refinement uh, with kinematical approximation, but it can be done. It's not weeks, it's not days, it's maybe minutes to first hours per cycle. So in X-ray diffraction, when you start refinement with Yana, you see the cycles go like this. So in electron diffraction, as you will see today afternoon in the, in the practical session, uh, it may be something like, for simple structure, something like one minute per cycle. So it's not as fast as X-rays, but it's still acceptably fast. You can get results within, within hours or days. So when I use the term dynamical refinement, that is a least squares refinement, a least squares structure refinement, where the calculated intensities are obtained not with the kinematical approximation as squares of the structure factor amplitudes, but they are obtained using the calculation involving dynamical diffraction theory, so essentially these formulas, and they include the dynamical effects. 
there are a few more details uh, that, uh, that make the dynamical refinement different from the kinematical one. The first one is that each experimental frame is treated separately. So the, the intensities are extracted on frame by frame basis and each frame is, uh, you know, the, the intensities are compared on each frame separately. Symmetry equivalent reflections are not merged, so there is no R int in this case, because the dynamical effects do not follow the symmetry. They are dependent on the exact orientation of the crystal, so two symmetry equivalent reflections need not have the same intensity. Uh, we need to refine crystal thickness, because the, the dynamical effects are uh, a function of uh, crystal thickness and orientation. Uh, so we refine the crystal thickness and we refine the orientation of the crystal with respect to the incident beam. And we need to carefully select the data that are used in the refinement. Not all the points in the diffraction pattern are suitable for, for the refinement. So this is the procedure as implemented in YANA. Um, we analyze the data, extract intensities uh, in a way similar to what we do with X-ray diffraction. You can use um, various programs. There are also X-ray based programs that have been adapted to uh, the treatment of uh, electron diffraction data. But there, is also, there are also programs specialized for electron diffraction data. And one of them is called PETS. Uh, uh, we are developing it in our laboratory and it is um, especially suitable because it provides data that can be directly read, uh, read in YANA. So if you process the data with PETS, it prepares you files that you can directly read uh, in YANA. So then you import the data and then you have a form that allows you to specify certain specific uh, parameters unique for electron diffraction. You can calculate the R value curves as a function of thickness. So this is an example of a nice curve uh, that shows the R value as a function of the thickness of the crystal. And you see a nice minimum at certain crystal thickness. Not all curves look as nice as this one. But uh, in general, if you have a good uh, crystal and good data, there is a trend for a minimum in the R values um, uh, as a function of thickness. And then after you set up these parameters, you will do it today afternoon in, in, the, in the practical work. You will see that it is not so complicated. Then you run just a normal refinement. You see the normal table of R values and the progress of the refinement. And you refine the structure in a way com you know, completely analogical to the refinement of X-ray data. So apart from a few things you need to know uh, that are special to the setup of electron uh, or of, of dynamical refinement. Most of the refinement is the same uh, for electron diffraction data as for X-ray data, including calculation of difference Fourier, uh, modifying atomic uh, types, um, defining disorder if there is some, and so on and so on. You may ask, why do we need to use, uh, um, or we need to use precession electron diffraction even if we do dynamical refinement? And you may ask, why is that? I said that the precession electron diffraction is uh, needed to suppress dynamical diffraction effects, but now I am saying that we have a procedure that includes dynamical diffraction effects in the calculation, so we should not need precession electron diffraction anymore. This is uh, not, not a good conclusion. In fact, we do need precession electron diffraction for dynamical refinement as well. And these plots show, um, they do not show why is it so, but they show that it is so. The left plot here shows an R value as a function of thickness for um, a tin indium, uh, um, no, gallium indium tin oxide. And the, the empty circles are R values calculated from a diffraction pattern without precession. 
and you see that the R values oscillate around 50%, 0.5, with no clear minimum. And this curve here is obtained from the same diffraction pattern, but collected with precession electron diffraction. And you see that there is a nice, well-defined minimum with quite acceptable R value of about 12%. This is another plot that shows the R value as a function of crystal orientation. This was done on, on a silicon crystal. <coughs> so these curves or surfaces show how the R value changes if you uh, tilt the crystal a little bit. And you see that the green curve is, uh, which is without precession, has, has a minimum, but it has a sharp rise of R values as soon as you move a tiny little fraction of a degree. If you tilt the crystal by 0 0.05 degrees, which is an imperceptibly small uh, rotation, uh, the R value goes up from 5% to 40%. And it's this sensitivity to thickness variation and to the, to the exact orientation that makes the fitting of uh, diffraction patterns without precession extremely difficult even with dynamical diffraction calculations. The precession, because it is doing the integrating movement, it integrates out a lot of this uh, unwanted uh, sensitivity and the result are then plots which are shown here in the red, blue, and, uh, and purple curves, which are the, um, the R values as a function of orientation for one, two, and three degrees of precession angle. And you see that the curves are much flatter, and therefore it's much easier to find a good orientation and get a good match. Uh, at the beginning uh, of the of the of the work on this project of dynamical refinement, we did quite a lot of uh, tests uh, tests on uh, known structures for which we had reference X-ray structures, so we could compare how accurate uh, results we can get. And this is a table showing some of them. I will not go through all the numbers, but uh, oh, sorry, but uh, just to highlight uh, some of them. So this, the first column is the result of kinematical refinement, the second column is the dynamical refinement, and you see the comparison of R values, which are typically around 20%. This is an extremely good case of 11%, otherwise it's close to 20 or more. And the refinement R values with dynamical refinement are all below 10%. They are not quite at the level of 3, 4% that we are obtaining with X-ray diffraction, but they are already in what I would say acceptable range of R values. What is more important is these numbers which show the average dis uh, discrepancy or displacement to reference atoms, so the average error of the, the structure determination compared to the reference X-ray structure. And here we are getting numbers that are around 0 0.01 to 0 0.02 angstroms. So that's about the accuracy that we can reach if we have good quality electron diffraction data and if we do the dynamical uh, refinement. This is the computing time per cycle on the normal desktop PC. So you see mostly it is in minutes for the most complex structure of orthopyroxene. This was 38 minutes per cycle. So then yeah, you can drink a few cups of coffee before the refinement is done, but still it's a matter of maybe one day um, to get the refined converged structure. The, the reason to get uh, a good description of the structure, of accurate uh, fit of intensities to the experimental intensities is not only to get accurate positions of atoms, because I can imagine that for some applications getting the positions accurate to 0.1 angstrom may be enough. Uh, the reason is also to get a more, more sensitivity of the, um, of the result to fine structural features, like sensitivity to atomic type. 
if you exchange two atoms with close, electro close number of electrons, you want your refinement to be sensitive and to tell you which of the two are the good ones. Or if you have some disorder or partially occupied uh, atomic position, you want to see that uh, and you want to be able to uh, describe these partially occupied sites. And uh, in this respect, uh, finding and locating position of hydrogen atoms is the ultimate challenge because hydrogen atoms really have the lowest scattering power for both electrons and X-rays. And in addition, they have uh, vibrational parameters that are larger than uh, the vibrational parameters of other atoms in the structure. And therefore, their signal is very weak and difficult to detect. So in a sense, if we can show that our method allows uh, location of hydrogen atoms, uh, then it's a sort of a proof of the sensitivity and reliability of the method. So the weak signals in the diffraction or are detected uh, during structure solution uh, using the difference Fourier map. You have done this uh, many times in the practicals. So this is a, a standard, a routine procedure during the structure solution process. Um, for dynamical uh, diffraction, uh, the calculation of difference Fourier map is not as straightforward as for mm, kinematical data. For kinematical data, you just calculate a difference of the structure factor amplitude. Uh, so this would be the experimental one, properly scaled, and this is the model structure amplitude. In uh, dynamical diffraction, we do not have direct access to experimental structure factor amplitudes because the intensities are not a simple function of structure factor amplitude. So we need to make an estimation of the difference by looking at the difference of the intensities or squares, square roots of intensities and scaling it by the ratio between the structure factor amplitude of that reflection and its model intensity. So it's an approximation, but it turns out to work quite well. And this is the result of uh, our efforts. Uh, these are the two cases uh, uh, that we showed uh, used as a first demonstration, the structure of paracetamol, uh, an organic painkiller uh, drug, and the structure of cobalt aluminophosphate, which is an inorganic framework material. Um, on in the center, you see the crystals that were used for uh, the data collection. On the right, on the left, sorry, you see the result of the kinematical refinement where there are a few possible positions of hydrogen atoms visible in the paracetamol case, but not, not a hint of good uh, hydrogen uh, position for the cobalt aluminophosphate. On the right-hand side, you see that if we do the dynamical refinement, uh, the positions of hydrogen atoms are all clearly located uh, in the difference Fourier map, and they are all above the noise level. And the same is true for uh, the cobalt aluminophosphate, where again we can nicely locate the hydrogen atoms belonging to the, the water molecule coordinated to aluminum. And what is even more interesting in this, this structure contains uh, a partially occupied uh, cobalt site, which uh, alternates with uh, an orientation of hydrogen atoms that points into that uh, cobalt place if there is no cobalt atom in there. So there are actually partially occupied hydrogen positions and uh, we could detect even these partially occupied hydrogens in the difference Fourier map. Well, that was, uh, that, uh, was so interesting that uh, it was actually, it appeared actually on the on the title uh, page or on the cover of Science in January 2017, which I'm not showing here just, just to show off, but I uh, just want to make a point that you can do, you can have a nice and interesting and, and broadly accepted result doing essentially pure crystallography even nowadays. So there is still, there are still things to be done in crystallography that are interesting. A few more examples. Uh, unfortunately, these videos uh, just resist loading. Unf 
So you can see just one of them. This is um, uh, a boron cage with hydrogen atoms uh, on that. So again, we can nicely see that uh, the hydrogen positions are well located uh, in the whole molecule. And these two, this would be another form of paracetamol. This is an inorganic structure, uh, sodium, calcium, uh, carbonate, where again, the water molecules can be uh, nicely, nicely found. Uh, locating hydrogen turns out not to be the, the absolute, uh, absolutely most difficult thing you can do uh, in crystallography. Uh, those of you who work with uh, intermetallic compounds, you have the, the experience that locating um, metal atoms with close atomic numbers and distinguishing between them is, uh, is very difficult. So here, the, this is a, a little overview of uh, a work uh, that uh, we have done with Mariana on nickel uh, titanium alloy on a new phase, uh, which contains uh, um, nickel and titanium. And these two elements are very difficult to separate in electron diffraction data, because as you can see here, uh, they have very similar scattering powers. So we needed to apply uh, quite elaborate uh, analysis of displacement parameters and also uh, interatomic distances and uh, symmetry analysis. But finally, uh, we could uh, get what I, I really believe is the correct assignment of nickel and titanium uh, atom, atomic types to uh, each of the 11 independent atomic positions in this structure. And again, this was only possible thanks to the dynamical, uh, dynamical refinement, which was accurate enough to give us uh, the slight different differences in the signal between nickel and titanium. So that was uh, about an overview of the current status of uh, electron crystallography. I have not um, commented very much on uh, the developments towards uh, structure determination of beam sensitive samples. There are also uh, important progresses in that direction. So there is there are a couple of uh, um, a couple of interesting publications uh, over the last year or so that show that uh, using the same methods we can analyze also quite beam sensitive materials, organic, organometallic stuff. But right now for those 10, about 10 labs that are working with electron diffraction and electron crystallography, um, solving and refining structures uh, from electron diffraction has become an essentially routine job. The task now is to show to other people, other material sciences, scientists, other crystallographers that this is the case and attract them to this method and uh, demonstrate that uh, this method really has the power of solving uh, the problems that seem to be very hard or even impossible with other methods. Uh, as a little illustration, I can tell you that uh, um, not so long ago, maybe a year ago, we published uh, a paper on um, what, is, uh, what is it, titanyl sulfate, um, a compound that uh, we solved in, in a week or so. Of course, then finalizing the solution took a bit more time, but the solution was there in about one week from uh, the experiment. And there is a whole PhD thesis dedicated to the solution of this crystal structure. And the conclusion of the PhD thesis was that it was not possible to solve the crystal structure. Uh, and we did it in a week. That's not because that guy doing the PhD thesis would be stupid and we would be that much brilliant. It's because we have a method that can solve the problems that other methods cannot solve. So this is our task as electron crystallographers now to show to the, the broader uh, scientific community what are the, what's the potential of this new method. 
There is also an important development of in instrumentation. There are new detectors that are much more sensitive, that are essentially noise-free, and that allow us to collect higher quality diffraction data in much shorter time, and they mean a, a, also a, a, a real qualitative jump or leap forward uh, in electron crystallography. And uh, um, I mentioned that already, but these better cameras and also automation allow us slowly to do things also on uh, beam sensitive materials, including protein crystals and complex organic molecules. Finally, a few acknowledgements for, uh, to my collaborators from Institute of Physics, uh, Mariana, who is here, Václav Petříček, who is the, the main coder of Jana 2006 and implemented many of the things uh, for electron crystallography, Peter Brazda, uh, another collaborator who works mostly on the, on the organic materials, Sincha, um, a, a former PhD student, and then a couple of people from other labs around the world uh, who collaborated on the development of the methods in one or another way. And with that, I thank you for your attention. So, and with that, off record, I thank you once more for your attention, for your patience through all these uh, 10 hours of lectures. I hope it was uh, 